Ginsburg and Corfo were sitting in a cafe in New York discussing who they were and what they were doing. And um, Corso said, we're beatitude, of course, meaning holy. That idea uh, was consistent in all beat writing ever since, even the scatological writing of William Burroughs was all metaphysical. There were people uh, who developed the idea that beat meant down and out uh, at the end of one's tether and so on. But they weren't that at all. They were really holy. We are, all of us are traditional writers and amongst our traditions, uh, I am the only one who was chosen on Chaucer as my model. I've had 14 books published, which you can find in the main library. Um, well, like Chaucer, I am both classical and spontaneous. My role is as a pure poet, like Ace Cricket. I didn't do anything else, I don't do anything else but poeticize. Voices from the past filled up his ears on what to recollect. I was the praying mantis, and all were of my kind. With fixed, glazed eyes, we marched strong in our mirage of paradise while the bats flew down. I told them. Hitler was still alive, so they emptied my pockets and dressed me in a smock of coarse canvas. Hence, many pairs of spectacles as worn by Chinese sages. And I shall tell you of my sacred wedding in Paris. still lives was something that I hallucinated in the very famous nut house in Paris called Saint Anne where Charcot invented hypnotism. I left, uh, well, well, I left a number of times. The very first time I left was because I had an affair with a medical student's wife. My uh, father was a professor at medical school and it, it was just too much. <laughs> so he and my mother, to be sure that I'd leave, took me to Cape Town and put me on a boat. And 
Unfortunately, I met Burroughs, Geisen and Corso by mistake. And they knew who I was, that I was senior editor of Olympia Press and that I'd published a book with them which had become a great success. And they wanted me really to have them published there. So they spent about three days trying to talk me into moving into the Beat Hotel. The function of the Dream Machine was to produce mandalas in the inner eye. It got taken up by the very rich. And people like Alina Rubenstein had her Dream Machine. And there was a photograph in the New York Herald Tribune came out in, in Paris with her and her dream machine. It was a rage to buy a dream machine made by Brian Geisler. A very large mandala, about the size of my head, is now present. Uh, Burroughs um, wrote a book called The Naked Lunch. Um, the title was given to, to, to the book long before he even wrote it by Jack Kerouac. The idea of Naked Lunch was um, eating things absolutely raw and truthfully. Allen Ginsberg said, look, I'll take the manuscript as it is to uh, Gerodias of Olympia Press in Paris and get him to publish it. And he went in a very pompous and dictatorial way to, uh, to Gerodias. And Gerodias says, no, how can I publish this mess? It looks like a ball. <laughs> uh, so, five years passed, um, and nothing was done with it, except that um, sections of the novel were published in a magazine called Big Table. Gerodias thought, well, uh, that's something in, fa in the favour of publishing The Naked Lunch. What do you think of me? So I said, yes, 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 let's publish it. So I hadn't seen Burroughs for about three weeks. I'd been away. And I come to his room at the, at the Beach Hotel and uh, uh, knock on the door and he opens the door and he says, well, it's wonderful to see you on time. Usually my patients, young patients like you, psychiatric patients, uh, uh, they, they, they never turn up on time. <laughs> so um, I sat down and I had to pretend I was a psychiatric patient. So he said to me, what kind of psychiatry do you want? Do you want psychoanalysis, or this or that, or do you want retroactive? So I said, well, retroactive. And uh, all those sheets of paper up there, uh, perhaps I can take them away for the weekend and uh, study, you know, and get an idea. They said, sure, take the lot. So I took the lot. And it so happened that in the mixture of papers was the Naked Lunch, which I immediately took to 
uh, my publisher's printer and had them printed out. Listen to me. You're just gonna have to leave town. And Interzone is the only place that will have a shady character like you at such short notice. Take this. Take what? What is that? Your ticket to Interzone. Tourist class, I'm afraid. But what can you expect these days? We'll contact you there. The Naked Lunch is important because of its gargantuan sense of humor. If people take the trouble to understand literature, they will discover that the Naked Lunch is as good as anything Rabelais ever turned out. You can only define it in terms of history literary history. Minutes to go with a book that uh, the beat writers, including myself, produced at the Beat Hotel. It consisted of cutting up various pages from various books, mixing them together in a bowl, and pulling out the pieces and putting them next to each other, and hopefully coming across an accidental association of words which were very meaningful but this one could never have thought of. The message is to feel um, happiness as much as one can, excitement as much as one can, uh, sorrow when it presents itself, anguish when it presents itself. In other words, all the feelings that a human being is capable of feeling. The wind blows, and the balancing pole makes my shoulders ache. I did not choose this way, and there is no other. I kept a kind of flying machine stability on a cupboard full of drugs. As I fly through the day, I could hear my nerves creaking. I look over the side, and below I see the horrors of enemy territory, the mental hospitals, while tears pour down my cheeks, while I tell my daughters nothing but truth matters, nothing but truth matters. The plague has come, merchants, judges, princes, all poor before the plague. See how you die in the streets. Rich man, poor man, the plague has come. Ah, oh, the dead, like boyer, black, black. All the veins of fear opened. I got a, a letter from Jack Cope saying that I'd won the prize. Um, it was the first uh, Ingrid Jonker prize. And uh, 
I gave a little blah about why and so, stuff like that. And um, then they said, well, uh, you can't come to South Africa. Uh, go to London and William Plomer will award you to you at the Poetry Society. The place was full of poets, singing odes to bullfighters. They flung their words like carnations and roses into the arena, and their screaming brought the rain. Despite the television, despite the drugs and electric shocks, the wind blows. Publish in libraries alone for two reasons. The first is the books are read by people who know how to read. They don't just stand on shelves in bookshops in lots of about six inches and somebody might just pick up one uh, because they're bored and never ever read it. Uh, the books that go, I know, that go to UNISA um, are recommended to staff and students and they are read. And that is, that, that my work is read is very important to me. I believe in, I'm a strong believer in uh, personal integrity and individuality. I am therefore very unpopular amongst local poets who, whoever they are, uh, live collectivized lives. Uh, sharing each other's images and um, areas of poetic exploration. Um, they are realists, uh, social realists, whereas I am a surrealist.
driving license. More people are dying of old age than of AIDS. Oh. 